Okay, hey everyone. I've been a while since I've done one of these podcast type deals, but this is one that's been a long time in coming. Very lucky today to be joined by Dr. Dan Lomas, who is an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham. Dan Lomas is an expert on intelligence history and is often consulted for his opinion on current intelligence affairs on things like the BBC, CNN, and has written a number of times for the Royal United Service Institute. Thanks for having me on, Ed. Um, yeah, it's been great. I know we've tried to do this for a long time, so good to chat finally. Yeah, really pleased to have you on, really am. So I thought um, we might talk today about some of the current affairs that are going on in intelligence and also some of the changes and challenges that the intelligence community is sort of undergoing at the moment. And I thought we'd start with, I know it's a hot topic in the UK at the moment, but the Chinese spy drama in Parliament. So I haven't followed this particularly closely because I'm not in the UK at the moment, and I'm sure you can fill in the details. But for anyone who doesn't know, uh, there's been a bit of a fuss recently in that one of a, a particularly well-connected researcher has been, he, I believe he's suspected. I don't know if he's been charged, but for basically running an influence campaign for the Chinese. Yeah, so, um, you know, Westminster has been full of gossip over Chinese spying allegations. And um, there's been a lot out there already about kind of China and the threat it poses to national security. So a few weeks before this, months now, Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee published their long-awaited and um, controversial report on China, um, suggesting that, you know, the PRC is uh, an existential threat to UK national security and that, you know, the Chinese have penetrated most areas of British society from you know, politics, universities, sector, mm. uh, through to kind of tech and, 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 and other aspects of UK national national life. Um, and, and most recently, the, you know, what we're referring to then, the Times newspaper had a, had a major scoop that uh, back in spring uh, 2023, a, a, a researcher working at the heart of Parliament had been uh, arrested and released on and released on bail pending pending further charges regarding spy, spying spying allegations for the PRC. The scoop also, and the Times went on to name the individual, and I, you know, I, let's not name him because again, the allegations are up in the air at the moment. Yeah, yeah, there was a true. second um, individual also arrested. And I think really, when I was listening to this and watching kind of a lot of the coverage, my, my initial response was, well, kind of spy, spy kind of thing that, yeah. you know, the UK, the UK, for everyone listening to this, you know, has, you know, had a well-organized intelligence and security apparatus. And, you know, that we have been spying on other states and other states will routinely spy on, on us. But it's just this story has kind of been, you know, politically controversial because, it's kind of broken at a time when the Conservative government at the moment, the Conservative Party, is ripping itself apart over, yeah, you know, is China a, is China a threat, um, or is China someone you know we should is 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 China a competitor that we should work with in the international community? And as I kind of summarised to someone earlier this week, it's kind of a, it's it's kind of a debate between what I call hawks and doves in the Conservative Party. Yeah, you've yeah. got kind of the hawkish elements who are kind of China is the existential threat. We shouldn't engage with them. And there are all sorts of allegations about Chinese-made electric vehicles, China as a tech um, provider, you know, effectively infecting parts of the UK state. There's a story today about China, a, a teapot, um, which has listening devices in it that was given to a British diplomat. So all these kind of stories are used to kind of, you know, say basically the UK doesn't deal with China. There are, on the other hand, those in government who I'm slightly sympathetic for who would suggest that, yes, China is a threat, but at the same time, you can't just not engage with China and you've got to engage with them economically, politically on most mm. of the big issues of the, of the day. So this story really is kind of being used as, you know, as a stick really to kind of beat government with because it's, it's China policy is being considered to be too, too soft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well so i'll just interrupt i was going to say it's interesting that the revelation came out in the news it came out in the times as you point out this wasn't you know so, so i'm assuming someone at oh, this is an assumption someone in the intelligence services leaked that to maybe policy 
there is that option. I mean, there is potentially the option, but there, there have been, there was an example from 2022 where MI5 came out and said that there was um, a Chinese lawyer with connections with politicians and there was a particular Labour MP that was funded, his constituency office got funded yeah. for a massive amount of cash. MI5 actually came out at that point and said that this is unprecedented, we're releasing this information. There's not been a similar release from the security service on this occasion. And, and what, I, what I would suspect has happened is that it's been known for some time that this particular researcher was you know, not around and not engaging in parliamentary business. And the, yeah. you know, the fact that he'd disappeared or withdrawn information would have come out and what i what i'm suspecting is given the, the time it was released via the times is it might be one of the hawks within the conservative yeah. party kind of apparatus has leaked kind of this information because really it's just a rumor effectively passed along a rumor yeah kind of because a lot of the i mean the stuff in terms of kind of what what he's been arrested what he's been arrested for it's it's alleged that he's been providing information and that this had have breached the official secrets act and he's been arrested on the certain terms of the official secrets act yeah. but beyond that we don't really know kind of much in the way of what information has been given over who he's been meeting um nothing has been revealed about the identity of the second individual either or who they who they are so again a lot remains in the air and a lot of people are kind of guessing and stabbing in the dark on this but again i would I would say this more has more to do with kind of conservative party politics and paranoia than it has to do with, you know, a major national security scandal on the lines of, say, uh, um, kind of your Edward Snowden's of this world and that kind of yeah, you know yeah. high level top secret material. There's yeah. there's nothing at this point to suggest it's like that, but everything to suggest it's to do with conservative party politics. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard that that, that take before, but yeah, that makes sense. And of course, this is not the first time there's been controversy over influence by foreign powers, influencing certainly the, the, the Tory party. I mean, uh, there was a Russian guy who was made a lord, and that also blew up when Ukraine happened, because it was like, oh, okay, he's like quite well connected to the Kremlin. Uh, was it Lav Lavrov? I can't remember his name now. Uh, there was, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that UK parliamentary democracy is kind of open to being subverted by foreign powers of influence is kind of not entirely new i think we've you know again we've 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 had this and there's been allegations in the cold war that you know funding of party political you know party politics buys influence that you know political ideologies should again shape influence in the heart of westminster um and again yeah the big the big problem particularly for the conservative party and you know other political parties to a lesser extent was foreign influence and fund party mm -hmm. funding and you're right, you know, the Ukraine war led to this big concern about kind of Russian influence on UK party politics. And there's a clamp down on kind of funding within UK party, you know, the UK political system. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's clear that, you know, individuals and groups, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, can, you know, leverage some form of influence using money, using friendship ties, that kind of that kind of that kind of stuff i mean in this instance this particular parliamentary researcher and uh, what's happening here it is likely that china is not acquiring information on kind of top secret information because that's not floating around westminster yeah but it might be the case that they're, they're acquiring information on kind of political political issues so who's speaking yeah. to who you know who's winning in the hawks and doves of the conservative party yeah um, yeah who's kind of going out for drinks in Westminster and what gossip can be picked up on. And that kind of gossip is kind of useful because it gives, you know, the PRC some fix, some insight into what's happening in the yeah. UK. And it's kind of really important kind of information. Yeah, I mean, especially at the moment for China, because China's, it's always difficult to tell with China. They do appear to be undergoing some sort of crisis, certainly the financial and demographic crisis, but also they're facing greater challenges from, America and you know other other European nations, Australia. I mean, America, Vietnam just signed basically, effectively, almost a strategic alliance, which is obviously aimed at China. So yeah, I mean, the Chinese want you know, they'll, they'll be wanting to know what's going on in the the upper echelons in it, or, you know, all across the world, and that's that's 
basically the governance of intelligence gathering. And as you say, the British do it, the Americans do it, which is policy effectively. Yeah, I think, you know, we are, we have been behind the curve. I mean, Australia, obviously Australia, there's been a lot out there about the Australian government's response to China. And certainly yeah. the United States has been quite clear on the threat posed by China as a, you know, for industrial espionage and kind of wider espionage in the United States. The UK is, again, the security service, and there's been accusations that the security service is behind the ball on this. I don't necessarily buy that. I don't necessarily buy that MI5 and others have been behind the curve when it comes to China. I think the rise of nation state threats, you know, is competing for resources against stuff like counterterrorism. Um, you know, terrorism remains the immediate threat to UK national security. Yeah. And obviously, if something happens, um, people will be asking questions as to why, you know, people are being killed in a terror attack, etc. So MI5 is kind of competing with these these various issues. But the UK government, I mean, recently has passed, for example, the National Security Bill um, in July of this year. So it makes it easier to kind of identify and target hostile foreign interference within the UK. Um, yeah. Various caveats of the legislation mean that investment into the UK is subject to scrutiny by the UK government. And a lot of the stuff to do with kind of China, uh, Chinese influence being spread by, you know, cultural exchanges and uh, the setting of front organizations under this bill is, you know, can be guarded against because individuals have to own up to where they're getting sources of their funding from. So if they're yeah. coming from a Chinese organization, they have to admit this. And it makes it much easier for the government to kind of clamp down on this. this yeah. interference. So as you say, I mean, yeah, obviously counterterrorism is still the primary concern, but this is almost like a gradual shift in priority by certainly by the security service to a recognition that, okay, we now have to go back to more effectively traditional concerns of nation state issues. Yeah. Yeah. We're kind of seeing, I mean, this is kind of what we're seeing is, is a refer, is a return to what we call counter subversion. Yeah. Um, and the big thing, and one of my, one of my colleagues here at Nottingham, Rory Cormack was kind of his response. And I agree with this was, well, China's spying, so what? It kind of brings back this idea of um, what we call influence or subversion. Now, subversion kind of was a dirty word because in the Cold War, it was kind of politically charged. So, yeah. you know, various things could be branded as subversive and there's no legal, there was no legal strict definition. The idea was that you're undermining the state mm. and kind of, you know, we try to move away from this idea of defining subversion as a national security threat. But what's happening recently is this whole thing about interference and elections and buying politicians. You're you're seeing kind of subversion being rebranded under this hostile foreign state kind of label. Yeah. So the the thing is, and it's quite comforting for me as a historian, is we're kind of returning to kind of the the old days of. Yeah. <laughs> version and branding it and repackaging it yeah yeah that's fair enough i mean uh, i haven't said that i mean intelligence is changing i mean uh you've written a few papers before i read one recently but uh, about the challenges faced by traditional it's often portrayed as a challenge to traditional intelligence services but the uh growth of osin now I think me and you both agree on this, that, you know, that actually we see them as complementary and they kind of always have been. I mean, intelligence services have always used OSINT sources. I mean, in the old days, it was radio, TV and newspapers. Now it's, you know, Oryx blog and watching Telegram channels. But yeah, I mean, uh, how do you view that? Do you, I mean, how intelligence is evolving in the modern digital age? Yeah, I would, I would, kind, of, I would kind of argue against the idea and it, it's actually become quite trendy by some to argue and there's numerous people out there that have said this, that, you know, intelligence, secret intelligence agencies and intelligence communities are now increasingly under threat because there's a big open source community out there who can, mm. in many ways, do things that we see that we don't necessarily see the secret intelligence agencies kind of, kind of do. My line, two things, really. One, yes, I mean, the, the information space we live in today is perhaps much more challenging and much larger than the information space we've had in previous years. Yeah. So the internet, you know, the internet of things, the fact that I can, you know, go on social media, I can do, you know, I can search Twitter, or Telegram for stuff that's happening in the war in Ukraine. 
yeah. you know you can you can do a lot of stuff through the information space that we have today and i think yeah the internet is growing bigger and faster than anything we can conceive um, yeah. and it will grow bigger than anything we can you know foresee within the next few years but i would say that you know we only see and we we only see the tip of the iceberg when it comes to secret intelligence we see the head of mi6 we see the head of gchq give a speech yeah. and they will say yes we're doing this or the head of the cia bill burns will talk about something um but we're not seeing beneath that all the stuff that secret intelligence agencies are doing on a yeah. day-to-day business and like you alluded to and yeah I've, I've said previously i would say that the open source and the secret world are kind of complementary absolutely yeah right. so the world of secret intelligence has not existed in this it's not it's never been in a vacuum so you know we can think back to um you know spying and second all this profession going back hundreds thousands of years you've always recruited spies but at the same time you've always had kind of diplomats or emissaries going overseas and speaking to people and chatting to people and collecting what we might call gray information so just stuff that foreign governments might surrender in conversation with diplomats that's always been really really important um add to that kind of yeah reading the newspapers reading newspapers reading journals academic journals these have all been really really important i think what's changed is our ability to just collect all this information now the problem the big problem i've always said with open source is when it's good it's good so the yeah. bell and cats of this world are outstanding the problem is that when austin is bad it's really bad so yeah. one of the things one of the things that and you you've you've commented on this and we've had a chat about this one of the things that really gets me is kind of like what i might describe as um war porn almost the fact that you've yeah. got the kind of there's a community out there who just want to be seen as relevant, so they will comment on everything. And at the moment, we're watching, obviously, the Ukrainian counter-offensive, the Ukrainian offensive take place. The amount of people who will colour in satellite images of Ukraine based on things they think they've seen that day to show how well the offensive is going. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's, some really hot, there's some really nonsense commentary and assessment that's taking place out there. And people get stuff wrong. I think AI is something that increasingly is going to ch- the, the the fact that you can create fake stuff using AI. Yeah, absolutely. Social media. Yeah. So these analysts are going to get it massively wrong. This is where secret intelligence kind of comes in here because both in terms of collection, so unique sources, I am not aware of anything in the open source world that will give you the insight that a well, that's a really good human intelligence agent that's been yeah. recruited could give you neither am i aware of i mean there are clips of this open source signals intelligence where people are listening against russian communications and then publishing it yeah. but you know an agency like an agency like gchq or the american nsa have access to perhaps far more information that can be just hoovered up and processed oh than yeah yeah anyone. well there's, there's a reason why those rivet joint aircraft are flying up and down the russian border and yeah, yeah exactly. Up, everything you know, someone farts on the radio, and they know. Yeah, yeah. And this is kind of the ability to just collect that information is one thing, and then the ability of kind of experienced analysts in US, UK government to kind of look at this information, yeah, um, and subject it to the rigorous assessment that we need it to be subjected to. That that is only achieved through secret intelligence. So, you know, a lot of people out there, when they get sniffy about DI's daily intelligence, Twitter feed, yeah, that you can do, but that's just the the tip of the iceberg there. So I'd say kind of, you know, don't write off secret agencies because they're still kind of valid, relevant at the peak of their game. The the Chinese certainly still appear to be banking on them, allegedly. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, if it's good for others, it's good for us. Yeah. I actually found referring to the Chinese again. I think that's always been their great strength has been humming because traditionally signal intelligence has been one of their weaker spots. Although I think they're trying to catch up with uh, with that. But yeah, human intelligence is definitely their strong point. And I mean, the other issue you've got with this uh, digital the digital age is, of course, the actual security implications on in terms of breaches. Because we've seen 
a number of cases recently, even silly things, which I think are overblown, but there's even silly things like confidential military documents being posted on Discord channels for, for, for gamers and stuff. But you've also got some more serious ones like the uh, recent one in America where that Air Force man was just, yeah, again, I think he was just, just sticking on Discord to, to show off. And that, again, is an issue. How, how, do you think the intelligence agencies will be able to deal with that, or it's just a case of clean up the mess when it happens? Again, I think I think a lot of this, and it's it's kind of bad, is it's you have to kind of... Damage has to be done first before the leak happens, and then yeah. it's kind of firefighting. I think the problem, the big thing about the Discord leaks, was particularly in the US, was this, the size of the US intelligence community meant that so many people had access to this type of these types of intelligence assessments that yeah if leaks cause cause big damage and i think it's you know really 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 problematic i mean the guy who leaked was from some sort of relatively obscure national guard intelligence unit which in hindsight kind of really should not have had access to this yeah. kind of information yeah. um i think you know in the american sense i think it's really difficult to you know to to kind of monitor who has access, who can potentially kind of leak this information. I mean, it seemed in this case that the guy who the guy who leaked it was kind of leaking for ego purposes to develop yeah. friendships. And it's quite a sad way to leak information in the end. But, you know, it always comes back to that human flaw. Yes. You can have kind yeah. of all the cyber folk, you know, you can have all this cyber geekery out there. But at the end of the day, if, if there is someone who's disgruntled who wants to leak, then they will necessarily do that. The other interesting thing, and this is kind of brings back to the earlier point about the disc about secret intelligence. US intelligence actually come out quite good from the Discord leaks, I think. And this was one of the things that struck me was they're talking a lot about the heavy penetration of Russia's military and political establishment. Yeah. The US have lots of information about what the Russians are up to. And in fact, the, the Americans seem to know more about Russia than they did about what's happening in Ukraine, about what the Ukrainians were doing. Um, right, yeah. Because of their, because of their, you know, because of their dominant secret intelligence collection and assessment yeah. capability. And Russia's been a focus for their attention, obviously, for probably that, well, certainly the last decade intensively. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting to say, and I think the Ukrainians got a bit smarter on their counter uh, counterintelligence stuff as well. So, again, not, not so much of a focus for the Americans. And also, I think because of their penetration by Russian security services, they got a lot more secure themselves. But yeah, so, I mean, because there's a lot of things about Prigozhin's little episode and his march to Moscow. Like the, the Americans apparently knew about that before it happened. They they knew about it before anyone knew about it. So he's, I think you're right. It goes to show how well set the American intelligence apparatus is when it comes to Russia. Yeah. And again, it kind of underlines, underlines sorry, this idea that secret, again, secret intelligence is you know, not had. There's, there is... There is, I'll probably bet kind of my house on this. There's a lot of, there is tons of information out there that, you know, we do not, we, are, we do not have access to and yeah. gives us an unrivaled insight into um, what's happening in the battlefields of Ukraine and Russia's future mm -hmm. policy. And in, indeed, even, even in, I would say, China, you know, there is you know, the ability to collect information on the PRC. I mean, what we're seeing at the moment with China is one-way traffic. We're seeing kind of the effects of Chinese espionage in the West and, you know, but but the ability of the West to kind of gather information on China as well is 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 significant. You know, there have been a number of cases where China has arrested officials because they have allegedly been recruited by CIA whilst you know working overseas when traveling overseas. Yeah. So I'd say the West, you know, Western intelligence is probably having significant successes against the PRC, but we just again we don't see this. Don't hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of uh, like information released by intelligence services in the West on the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine. What's your take on that? Is it, I mean, it, it's probably the most vocal we've seen in a long time, the intelligence services putting out this sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, so the stuff on, I mean, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, Western intelligence, you know, obviously we said for years about secret intelligence, Western intelligence have been collecting lots and lots of information on kind of Russia's military maneuvers and the build-up of 
Russian forces on the borders of Ukraine, kind of going going back even before even so, the you know, many of the military maneuvers and training exercises that the Russians were doing with the with with, with Belarus before that. But hmm. you know, you started to see probably about November, November twenty twenty one, December. Yeah. Um, yeah. U.S. intelligence officials increasingly saying that you know they were warning against the, the build up of Russian forces on the borders of Ukraine. They were suggesting that an invasion was 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 kind of was kind of likely. And what you saw over kind of January into February of twenty twenty two was you know intelligence officials and even our own defense intelligence here in the UK were. You know, going on social media and saying that we we think it is highly likely an invasion is going to take place, and you know, even thinking thinking back to that time, Ministry of Defense even trolling the Russians by saying that we think that you're going to invade on these axes and this is going yeah. to be the life into Ukraine. Yeah, unprecedented. You know, unprecedented kind of release of information on yeah. the likely invasion. Oh, um, I was got, I was got, sorry, I was got the impression that was like trying to warn the Russians off. It was like. We know what you're gonna do. Don't don't do this. Like we we know what you're gonna do. And yeah, well, I mean, there's 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 and again, it's 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 on the in the public record now that you know the the UK's chief of the defence staff, uh, Tony Radikin, was actually went to Moscow and and briefed you know Grasimov and Shoigu. Kind of this is the information that we you know potentially have. Kind of, of yeah, don't 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 push the button. Uh, um, Bill Burns, CIA director, again did similar kind of diplomatic missions to 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 Russia, and I think yeah, it's it's impre- I mean, we saw you know the big the big damaging thing for the UK was and the US was kind of the Iraq war and the publication of intelligence to support yeah. the Iraq the, 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 the invasion, which I think this time the thing we've got right this time is we're publishing our assessments, but with evidence to support those conclusions, and the evidence yeah. is we're not. We might be echoing some of the secret sources that we've got, but a lot of the stuff we're saying is actually backed up by the open source Planet Labs, for example. You know, you can get kind of openly available public stuff where you know you could clearly see the Russians are building up their forces on the border of Ukraine. As you could see it, you know, in 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 Planet Labs, you called because the Russians again were kind of quite stupid on this. Um you know, Russian service personnel in the fields around, you know, the borders of Ukraine saying we're here, kind of, this is what we're doing. You could, you could, you know, you could geolocate where Russian forces were. Again, the overwhelming evidence was the Russians are building up forces to kind of do something, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the indicators and warnings of a Russian attack were clearer, I think, once it started to get into January and February and early, early you know, early, uh, you know, the early part of February, where you started to see, for example, the Russians beginning to bring up medical, medical, you know what I mean? So if it's a military exercise, why, for example, do you need blood plasma? Um, That's limited lifespan on it, that kind of stuff. So apparently kind of the blood plasma thing was a whole kind of trigger, you know, that the invasion was likely to take place. The other, the other, the other thing about kind of why publish all this stuff is that what, like you mentioned, the warning to Russia, don't do this. But also, kind of just to prepare governments back at home, you know, people back at home, yeah, that this is going to happen. You know, there's a lot of talk. There was a lot of talk in the Johnson government at the time, the Conservative government at the time, about providing end law and providing some of the other anti tank capabilities to Ukraine. Is this escalatory? You know, if if we do this, is this going to force the Russians to kind of invade and do we want to kind of do that? And I think for people in the UK government who were reluctant to kind of provide Ukraine with more anti-tank capability and to provide kind of some more sophisticated stuff we're seeing now being supplied to the Ukrainians, the intelligence actually overcame some of that initial scepticism. And, you know, the Russians, let's not, let's not kind of beat around the bush. I mean, the Russians, okay, in the initial, the initial kind of strike towards Kiev ended in an operational and like you no know, operational failure for them. Oh, but crap, they... crap. And honestly, I've, I've been I, I'll quite go on record as I say, yeah, Russia lost this war when they failed to take Kiev, and I know it's still yeah. a long way to go to this war finishes, but I still say that's what I, I firmly believe that's what is going to end up happening. True, but in the, I mean the earlier. The stuff in the south and 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 you know Russia's ability to kind of strike 
into parts of Ukraine and take take territory. Yeah. Um, that I mean, that obviously could have been a lot worse if the US, predominantly the US initially, and then the UK and other European countries began to kind of step up and provide kind of some of that anti tank capability, yeah. which gave the Ukrainians the ability to kind of you know, I'm not saying again the Ukrainian military doesn't gone significant reform since 2014, but mm-hmm. you know. Western governments in the weeks and months before the invasion are actually starting to step up and provide some capabilities, yeah, um, yeah. which proved important in the opening kind of days and hours of the the, the Ukrainian the, the Ukrainian invasion. The other thing, kind of, I'd, I'd probably I need to say as well, we like to talk about NATO as this kind of organization, you know, group of nations that think the same, and actually, the Ukrainian invasion showed. They didn't. So, mm, you know, yeah, absolutely. the UK and US and also kind of the the Baltic states, some of the smaller Baltic yeah. member states were actually quite you know vocal on the threat. They, they were saying that this is going to happen. The Russians will invade. French military intelligence was certainly not of that opinion. I think the French, parts of the French intelligence community and parts of the French government were believing that an invasion would happen, but the invasion was going to happen you know, months down the line and that there was still diplomatic talks that to happen. In fact, I think the threat, I mean, the French reason for not believing in an invasion was likely at first was that it would go catastrophically wrong and that it would cause so much damage to the Russian armed forces that why would they actually do this? And I think in well, the end... They were halfway right. <laughs> yeah, so that assessment, I think, turned out correct. But in terms of the timing of the invasion, yeah. I think and that was... Um, and you, you go, of course, that you know the other side, which was Germany's BND, where the head of the German BND was actually in Ukraine the day the invasion happened, and yeah, yeah. Orton had to be escorted out of the country by, by German, you know, special forces. So you've got this range of kind of opinions. So I think the publication of intelligence was key. You know, it convinced it convinced skeptical Western governments that it was going to happen. It allowed it prepared policymakers to kind of step up and provide lethal weaponry to the ukrainians who could then use this to fight back and you know it's important for just calling out russia not to do this yeah. and of course that actually brings us on to the, the, you know we talked about nato and the western intelligence angle of course it, much more important really is the russian intelligence failure um the, the may, there's been major misconceptions on there and as you said about how western intelligence was able to listen to russians talking openly about why they were there there was that overconfidence, which was part of that failure to recognise what they were going to get them involved in. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the big ironies of kind of Russia's use of intelligence. That I mean, let's not let, let's be clear about this: the Russian Russian humans in Ukraine was is, was significant before the invasion. I mean, there were big parts of the Ukrainian internal security apparatus and political apparatus that were subverted by the russian state and there were lots of agents who in the immediate in the early days of the invasion had a difficult difficult thing because did they did they carry you know that do they carry on supporting kind of russian interest or do they support ukrainian interests and we've seen with you know a purge of pro-russian elements in the ukrainian state yeah there's still in fact going that's still going on what happened with the russians i think wishful thinking yeah, the idea that you just you know you go in on day one shock and awe and people are going to automatically give in, which is what um, they did in Crimea. Like, and they achieved that in twenty fourteen with Crimea. They just walked in, took over. Yeah, I think the other thing was again that there was there is a lot of information out there to show that elements of Russian intelligence, through extensive gathering of information, particularly in the the east of Ukraine, felt that because they were Russian speakers who were skeptical of the the Kiev the, the government in Kiev, they would automatically again the the the, tank, the BMPs would roll in and then they would automatically switch sides. Yeah, and I think that you know Russian Russian intelligence. Whether or not this was truthfully reported, of course, to the higher echelons of the Russian leadership remains to be seen. But there was that feeling that, yeah, optimism bias that, yeah, it's going to work because they're Russian, that they, they, they speak the language, yeah, they probably throw rules, so therefore it's going to it's going to work. Um, yeah. 
And they, I mean, the idea you can see kind of where the original, you know, deployment with the VDV to try and, you know, that 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 attempt to take uh, Hostimo, yeah, just like immediate, like proper market garden stuff, like yeah, we we'll just drop in, yeah, yeah kind of wishful yeah. thinking, kind of. yeah, yeah, major strategic uh, miscalculation. And it's interesting because I, I, you wrote, um, I know you joined, wrote a paper in uh, War on the Rocks uh, on both sides of the uh, intelligence thing, but dealing with the Russian part, and I'll link to that in uh, in when I post this. But uh, you said how certainly Putin's attitude, but probably the Russian government's attitude, that Ukraine isn't really a place. It, it's just sort of this mythological made up idea of a country. So really, they, they don't, they're not going to fight for it because it's not real to them. But that's more a reflection, I think, of the Russian's attitude, certainly Putin's attitude, than the Ukrainian's attitude, who obviously do have a pretty strong opinion on their own nationhood. Yeah, I mean, there's that famous, there's that, you know, Putin published that major essay or rant, whatever you want to call it, that was, again, kind of about Russian history and the politicization of Russian history to make it kind of seem that, you know, Russia was standing up for its interests in Ukraine and that, it, you know, the, 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 the two were tied to, to, together. There's the famous example where, you know, a couple of days before the invasion happened and Putin's talking to his National Security Council the head of Russia's foreign intelligence service is kind of told to, you know, speak up and say it louder and stop muttering and kind of embarrassed by kind of Putin. And I think the problem with Russian intelligence has always been politicization, you know, whether during the communist era it was their intelligence assessments were shaped by the need to, you know, talk about Marxist Leninist ideology and to kind of show yeah. off kind of that. That, you know, nowadays it's, you know, Again, kind of Russian intelligence not telling truth to power, or if they do tell truth to power, then that is simply ignored because the wider aim with. here was to go into Ukraine yeah. and, and therefore that's yeah, it's so I think it's interesting. We've seen intelligence failure on the one side, mm -hmm. um, intelligence success when it comes to kind of Western intelligence, I think, and what they've been what they've been up to. Yeah. And and as you point out, I think it's quite a good place to like start winding down now about talk. That very public use and publishing of intelligence and a much more public face that's kind of become it's been building up as policy for a while now certainly in terms of the british secret services and secret intelligence service and gchq they were always black holes for information as far as i was always concerned in decades past you know it's like james bond is the image of and i know you hate that but james bond is the image of british intelligence but that's because really that's all there was, was Fleming stuff. They never engaged publicly themselves. They're always like the dark, shadowy figures. But that's changing now, isn't it? So what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all in favour of it. I mean, I, the day of, back in the day, I mean, the day of a minister standing up and saying, trust me, you know, I'm a foreign secretary. MI6 does really good stuff. Um, doesn't wash anymore because the, the polling the, con the polling consistently tells us that people don't trust the politician to deliver to deliver Funny a that. message. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, political <laughs> parliamentary, scandal, parliamentary scandal. So you know, the polling again indicates that people trust officials. They trust the intelligence community to kind of say hmm. certain things. And I think that you know, when when it comes to kind of kind of passing key legislation, why we need national security, you know, the national security bill, why do we need it? Intelligence chiefs have to stand up and say, well, this is kind of why we need it. This is the threat. You know, director of GCHQ, head of MI6, um, Rich Richard Moore, they're 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 out there saying why China poses a national security threat, why Russia poses a national security threat. So there, hmm. there's that kind of horizon scanning and saying that these are threats you know recruitment you know i'm a university academic the day of kind of the tap on the shoulder at oxbridge has kind of long gone um yeah. so recruitment i mean getting out there and telling people you can work for us is kind of what they you know they need to do that to survive as organizations that are kind of you know relevant they also I mean they also need to kind of explain to people what they do as well and what they don't do so mm -hmm. uh, the overriding idea that intelligence agencies go around the world killing people that like it bond, you know, that's not what that's not what happens. That's not the reality. So, again, it's kind of explaining to people what they do, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a real is a, is a reason for doing that. And then also, finally, one of the things I've 
that I've enjoyed seeing is Western intelligence kind of poke fun at the Russians these days. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're using kind of media as a, an offensive weapon against Russia. So there was the the CIA advert that they put out there on Telegram and Twitter, where it's it's actively asking Russians to spy uh, yeah. the CIA. And there was the stuff Richard Moore head of MI6 SIS gave a speech in Prague recently where he he said um, our door is always open to any Russian who wants to come and work for the, the you know the service. So what you're seeing really is kind of intelligence agencies embrace media as a way of pushing out messages about what they do and what they mm-hmm. want to recruit. And, that. and I think it's really it's really good. I mean I. I'm all for it. I'm all for intelligence agencies engaging and saying stuff. I mean, well, I, I would point out you do have a bias because you know you are an intelligence historian, and you know, 20 years ago your job would have been far harder. Where it's like, hey, can you talk to me? No. <laughs> Whereas now, yeah, you know, I mean, they actively have people who will actively engage with you. Exactly. I mean, GCH. I mean, GCHQ's GCHQ's history team. You know, have a mailbox you can write to. You can, you know, and you, they will answer and respond to questions you put to them. GCHQ, we did like a BBC Ideas um, thing on kind of how do you become a spy kind of thing. And you had you had idiots like me kind of saying, about well, this is the kind of what happens in the real world kind of thing. But then you also had, you had a real a couple of real GCHQ employees who were in the video. And one of them, Joe Cavan, GCHQ's strategy director, was openly kind of talking as as her herself, so she's not a fictional person; she is yeah, real. Yeah. Um, talking about kind of the agency, and I think it's again, it's quite, it's it, it's good. I mean, it's good to see a chief of MI6 even on Twitter. I mean, Richard Moore's on Twitter, so yeah, yeah, yeah. News. And again, it's good, it's good. It shows what the service does and kind of gets it yeah. out there to a wider, wider audience. And it keeps, <laughs> yeah, like you said. Keeps me in a job, mate. So it's good. Kind of... <laughs> I mean, I mean, do you uh, to go on the? But we'll, we'll go we'll go the other way because to have a public like a media persona, effectively, like with the agencies are building, that also is something that can be damaged. So I wonder if I mean, obviously they have to handle it very carefully. But that I think if you're then going to have this public persona, that is an avenue of attack by your enemies. So yeah, they're wearing the the brand, and this is kind of yeah. I've said to inside, you know, people, former um, agencies and, you know, people who might have been on the inside, just, you know, I've described it as a brand and I've watched yeah. their kind of face get really angry about a brand. But it actually, yeah, I mean, you know, it that's is, what it is. You know, that's what it is. I'm sat here looking at an intelligence agency's mug um, and an intelligence agency's Christmas decorations yeah. kind of that I've collected over the years where it's branding, you know, it's they, they do create brands. Brand identities are kind of key. Stuff like the Snowden revelations back in 2013 and Ed, Ed, yeah. Edward Snowden's leak of all this yeah. stuff yeah. tarnished. Yeah, you know, there were people in Cheltenham who, you know, they're not the deep state. I mean, the Guardian was the newspaper of choice for staff, you know, people in GCHQ. It became tainted after the Snowden revelations and they kind of, you know, it it, it was not in favour for a long time. But the brand matters, you know. If you know if there are allegations out there that the intelligence services do all this devious stuff, it brands, it, yeah. it, you know, it, it destroys the brand, and I think that it it takes a lot of time to cultivate that um, yeah. and create that kind of image. So yeah, that you're right; they do need to toe a line between kind of yeah. And, and, but as you say, like, is, and you're, I think you're absolutely right. I don't know why they take exception to being called a brand because uh, I think actually the last talk, uh, one of these talks I gave was with. I can't remember her name, Anna. Anyway, she was, yes, who, who talked about ISIS as a brand. And that was very much a thing. You know, they, they really pushed their message and they marketed to get that message out. And that's really the way the world is now because we are so terminally online and everything's so connected. Yeah, again, yeah, it's 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 important. I think image image matters, you know, image image matters. And you know, for the, anyone who follows me on Twitter, my latest obsession is kind of um as a as a French there's a French TV drama called um the, the Bureau. Um and it follows it follows um France's DGSE, the Foreign Intelligence Agency. Oh right. Uh, yeah. They're a group of individuals who are running agents. And it's all it's all purely fictional, but 
DGSC actually got involved in the early production of kind of the earliest series wow. of the um of of this drama. Yeah, yeah. Um mainly to kind of you know the realities of human running kind of the the aura of kind of what the set would actually look like and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff so in their case i mean dgsc were actually quite keen to get involved in the early production mm. you know the early parts of the production process cia you know cia have actually been quite interested in its portrayal on film and again it's kind of some people might say it's the deep state messing around with kind of popular depictions, but actually it's the Bureau for me is not kind of a, an accurate depiction of intelligence as such. It's kind of fictionalized, but yeah. it's all the better, I think, for that kind of agency input because yeah. it gives a more realistic kind of interpretation. Yeah, of what might closer happen. to what it is actually like rather than your James Bonds and your Jason Bonds. Exactly. So I'd say kind of that age, and if anyone if anyone's interested in this kind of stuff, going out there and watching the Bureau, it's it's on a it's on a well known streaming site, but you can actually go out there and get. I'm old school. I got the DVD box sets, and it's it's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's five series that just captivate. It just keeps you, you know, it sucks you in, and you just watch it. Um, okay, I might check that out. So the Bureau of the Legends, but but yeah, DJSE were actively getting involved in the production process for this TV show which meant that people wanted to work for DGSE. So recruitment, you know, applications went, knowledge of DGSE actually went up um, yeah. when the TV series came out. Yeah, well, because I was interested because like, DGSE have always been one of the, the quieter uh, agents. I mean, obviously, because they're French and, you know, you know as an English person, you don't really pay that much attention, but they've always been even more silent than other agencies, like, in my experience. So to actually hear that they've, they've participate in this is yeah interesting and it's like a sign of how things are going so yeah, yeah it's, interesting so again it's brand but yeah that's yeah, what kind of yeah yeah they've all got everything you know i mean i suppose yeah i mean like, even things like mossad they get off they don't have to publish eyes because they just like have this terrible uh, fearsome reputation from years and years of actually doing stuff but you know these stories all get leaked somewhere and they say yeah as a recruitment met method and there's a a way of encouraging agents to come in and make themselves available. That was the traditional way to do it. No one, yeah, I no mean, one knows MI6, MI6 were for, you know, MI6 for reason, uh, former, you know, former chief of SIS would, would say Bond was our best recruiting sergeant. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think that that kind of brand, you know, I've referred to it here as MI6, it's SIS by, you know, officially, but, you know, when you're... Or are they... Well, exactly. but if you, I mean, you know, around the world, that matters. Association with that brand matters. So yeah, if you're yeah, thinking, yeah. who do I work for? Do I work with the Yanks and the CIA, or do I go and speak to the Brits and you know MI6 or whatever? You know, brand kind of again, brand matters in the real world for agent mm. agent recruitment as well. So and I've yeah. always wondered as well, like because obviously, yeah, Bond is just like over the top, but there's this thing about and it keep it always comes up routine is it's recently flat up but the whole thing about uh russia and their obsession the russians particularly their obsession with british intelligence and that goes back decades i think it goes back to the great game effectively but that's still very much like you know i, I can't remember it was recently done like this week you saw one of the russian ministers shouting about british intelligence had done something like i don't know space lasers or something but you go, where do you get these ideas? And I do wonder if it is the Bond influence. <laughs> yeah. They go, yeah, they can yeah. do all this. Go, mm, not really. <laughs> yeah. We do. I mean, we have lived rent free in the Russian's head for you know, the, the mind of the Kremlin since, well, 1917, even probably before then. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you watch these talk shows where in Russia they talk absolute bollocks for about, you know, about the war in Ukraine and that. The Brits do appear to be kind of the all-seeing, all-knowing um, bogeymen. Yeah, bogeymen. The same. I mean, in Iranian Iranian politics as well. Kind of the oh, kind yeah, of the impact yeah. of the two of fifty-three and that kind of, you know, the idea that the Americans, the Americans may be the guys that kind of have the real power, but it's the Brits who are able to kind of manipulate things behind the behind the scenes. So again, it's that 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 perception kind of lives on. It it matters. I would say it, yeah, it really yeah. does. It really does matter. Well, because if if it does nothing else but sow doubt in someone's mind in that sort of in a government position about who can I trust, who around me may be a 
British agent. You know, it's it's all a uh, all part of the game, and always has been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You kind of wish, you kind of wish almost that we were as <laughs> powerful as the you know as 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 we are portrayed by other other countries. Yeah, I mean. I think I read one, I can't remember, I think it was a fictional book once, but someone saying like, oh, he was CIA director and they committed a huge faux pas. And it was like, why do we miss it? Well, because the whole world thinks the CIA like, is like looking through your letterbox and listening to everything you do. And go, no, we're not. We can't. We wish we could, but we can't. But we don't discourage people from thinking that because then they second guess themselves and maybe they won't like plant that bomb in the US embassy if they're worried about us, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, image has always been a factor that even more so now. Um, I think we should uh, probably wrap it up. We've been gassing on for a while now. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on, Ed. Uh, no, it's been nice to chat to you. And it's yeah. been long overdue. We've been talking about doing this for I don't know a year at least, I think. So yeah, it's been a real pleasure to have you on, Dan. And uh, maybe we'll have you on again sometime in the future if some intelligence matters come up that you can weigh in on and give us your yeah. vast vast knowledge and experience. Thanks. No, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me on it. And um, yeah, anytime, anytime. Yeah. Brilliant. Cheers, Dan. Okay. We'll have a good one. Thanks everyone for listening. I hope you found it interesting and uh, I'll catch you all next time. You were called on. The calling in progress. Okay. Right. Right. Me, 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 me. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so we've seen a lot of... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, I'll take. <laughs> I might, I'll do it. I'll start, it's a bastard I'm trying to record and I'll start laughing.